Good morning. It is so good to see everyone here again as we continue to worship the Lord. Amen? Well, today we are uh, continuing our Transformed Spiritual Growth Series. I hope you have been enjoying it as, as much as I know I have. Uh, so far we have discussed how we can improve our spiritual health, our physical health, our mental health, and our emotional health. And today we're going to spend some time taking a look at our, our relational health. In other words, how the Lord can transform our relationships for the better. Let me ask you, who in here has at least one relationship you'd like to see transformed? Anybody? At least one relationship you think could improve? I think everybody here could say, yeah, there's one relationship in my life that I would like to see improved. You know, last week we said that our emotional health was probably the most volatile of all the different areas we had discussed. We said, you know, our emotions can change so rapidly and they can change so many times that our emotional health is very volatile. Well, if our emotional health is the most volatile of all the uh, areas in our life we were going to discuss, it's probably safe to say that our relational health is the most complicated of any area that we're going to talk about in this series. Our relational health is the most complicated of any of the things we're going to discuss. You see, when we're talking about relational health, not only do I have spiritual issues and emotional issues and mental issues and physical issues that I'm bringing into the relationship, but so do you. You have your own mental issues, and some of you got a lot of them, and emotional issues, and, and physical issues, and spiritual issues. And so when I bring all my issues, and I got a lot, and you bring all your issues, and you got a lot, and we start trying to have a relationship together, that's a bunch of issues going on there. All right? The best way to sum that up is to say, you know what? It gets complicated. Our relationship, our relational health gets complicated. Not only is it complicated because we all have different issues, and again, some of us have more issues than others. But it gets complicated because we play so many different roles in life. For instance, I have one relationship with my parents because I'm their child. I have another relationship with my children and I'm their father. Completely different roles. In one, I'm a child, I'm a son. In one, I'm a father, I'm a parent, I'm a guardian. Completely different roles. And because those roles are different, those relationships are going to be different. And not only do the roles change the way our relationship works, but personalities change the way a relationship works. Even when I have the same role, for instance, I have two children, but each of those children are very, very different. And so even though I have the same role, I'm a father to Lydia and I'm a father to Ford, my relationship with Lydia is different than my relationship with Ford because they're different people. Now, I don't love one more than the other because I was told you're not supposed to do that. So, I love them equally, but we're different. I treat them different, I act different, I talk to them different. Why? Because they're different people. So, you see, there's so much that goes in to relationships. There's so much to go into our relational health that it gets complicated. Again, I think we get the point. Relational health, relationships can be complicated. But listen to me this morning. Even though our relationships and our relational health can be complicated, our relational health is extremely important to our overall well-being. If we want to be who God wants us to be, it's not enough that we are spiritually healthy and mentally healthy and physically healthy and emotionally healthy. We also must be relationally healthy because it's an extremely important part of our health. You know, one of the first things in the Bible, one of the first things the Bible teaches us at the very beginning is that we cannot live alone. We were created to live in relationships. We were created to live in community. It's one of the very first things the Bible teaches us. In fact, right after creation, when the Lord is saying, I made this and it's good, and I made this and it's good, and I made this and it's good, there comes a point where for the first time the Lord says something is not good. Let's look at that together. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Genesis, because that's where we're going to be today. Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. The Lord says this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. The first time the Lord says anything is not good is when he looks at mankind and says, You can't be alone. 
You can't be by yourself. You were not created to be by yourself. You see, we believe God exists in in the Trinity. We believe in the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We believe that God exists within Himself in community. And so when we are created in His image, I can't be alone. Because that's not the way I was created. Old Testament scholar Kenneth Matthew comments on this passage. He says this, God has created human life to have fellowship with Him, but also to be a social entity, building relationships with other human beings. He says this, and this is really important. Isolation is not the divine norm for human beings. Community is the creation of God. That's profound. Community is the creation of God. We can't live alone. We're not meant to be alone. We are meant to have relationships. However, this kind of begs the question, what happened? Right? If God created us this way, if God created us to live in relationships, if God created us to live in community, if God created us to have relationships with each other, what happened? Why is everything so complicated? If God created me this way, why is it so hard? If God created us to live together in harmony and fellowship and relationships, why can't we get along? Well, I think we all know the answer, and the answer is sin. Many of you probably know the story. If you read Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3, the Scripture tells us that God did not leave Adam alone because it was not good that he was alone. He created a helper for him. He created Eve. And Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden in perfection and harmony and harmony, community and relationship. And everything was perfect until sin came into the picture. Until the serpent came and tempted Adam and Eve to do the one thing that God said don't do. And when they did it, when they allowed sin into the world, all of our relational problems began at that time. This morning as we look at this account in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3, we're going to identify three fears that can ruin our relationships. We're going to identify three fears that can negatively affect our relational health. And listen to me, all of these fears can be found in the first relationship. It all started in the first relationship. It all started with Adam and Eve. Again, if you have your Bibles, look with me at Genesis chapter 3. We're going to begin this morning immediately after Adam and Eve gave in to temptation. So again, you know the story. The serpent comes. The serpent tempts Eve. Eve gives in to temptation. She takes a bite of the fruit. She looks over at Adam and says, Hey, it's yummy. Why don't you have some? He says, Hey, why not? He partakes. And we're going to pick up right after that. Genesis Chapter 3 and verse 8. If you don't have your Bible, there's a Bible in your pew. Please take that with you if you don't have one. Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 8, the Scripture says this, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I've heard the sound of you in the garden. Listen to this. What did he say? And I was what? And I was afraid. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. The first fear, the first fear that we can allow to ruin our relationships is the fear of exposure. I want you to write that down this morning. You write it down in your transformed books. You write it down in your bulletin. The fear of exposure. Now, for Adam and Eve, the fear of exposure was quite literally, quite literal. Okay, they were literally exposed. They were literally naked, right? God shows up on the scene and He says, where are you? And of course, we believe God knew the answer to that. God didn't really lose Adam and Eve. God knew where they were, but He wanted to make a point. So God shows up in the garden and says, hey guys, where you at? Adam says, I'm hiding because I'm naked. There's a TV show, I don't know if any of you watch it, there's a TV show, Naked and Afraid. This is the very first episode. This is episode one of Naked and Afraid. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, naked and afraid. But listen close this morning because this is important. You see, Adam and Eve were not only afraid because they were physically exposed. They were afraid because their sins had been exposed. It wasn't just an issue of physical exposure. It was an issue of spiritual exposure. 
their sins had been exposed. They knew the moment God showed up, they knew we've been found out. God knows what we've done. They were guilty and they knew they were guilty. God was very clear. There is one thing you're not supposed to do and Adam and Eve both did it. And they knew that their sins were exposed. And here we are, thousands of years later, and that same fear of exposure ruins our relationships today. We are scared to death that people will find out our sins. We are scared to death that people are going to find out our shortcomings and our faults and our failures. And because we're scared of letting people get to know who we really are, we drive people away. We keep people out of a distance because we're afraid that if someone really knows me, they're really not going to like me. And so in order for you to like me, I've got to hide everything that's bad about me. And so on Sunday mornings, we're bad at the, about this at the church. On Sunday mornings, I put on my nice suit and I take a shower one time for the week and I show up to church and I'm smelling good and I'm smiling. And you say, Danny, how are you? I'm great. Well, I may not be great, but I'm afraid that if you knew I wasn't great, you wouldn't like me. We have a fear of exposure. We're afraid of really letting people know who we are. We're afraid that if people knew all of our mistakes and our faults and our failures, that they'd reject us. And this is exactly what happened with Adam and Eve. They were ashamed of their sins. They were afraid they would be exposed. And so they hid from God. How well that worked out for them. I remember when I was a kid growing up, we went to Lee's Fried Chicken. I know it's going to surprise you that we ate at Lee's Fried Chicken because my dad loves fried chicken. So if you know my dad at all, this won't surprise you. Does anybody remember Lee's Fried Chicken in Montgomery? All right. We used to eat at Lee's Fried Chicken like all the time. So we were at Lee's Fried Chicken one day, and me and my brother were goofing around and roughhousing and climbing on tables and doing you know, normal kid stuff. And uh, my dad corrected us on several occasions to which we ignored. And so finally he said, you know, that's it. When you get home, you're getting a spanking. So, of course, we lived in fear from the time he said that until the time we got home. So we got home. I don't know if it was me or my brother. Uh, I, I, I blame it on him, but I don't know who did it. One of us had the great idea of, let's hide. Because that'll make it better. I mean, really, at this point, what, what could go wrong? So I hide in the closet, and my brother hides under the desk, and my dad walks in the room. But that's okay, because we're hidden. And he just stands there for a minute or two. He doesn't say anything. And then he just sits on the bed. And now I'm thinking, oh man, I think he knows we're here. <laughs> I don't think this was such a good idea. It may surprise you, but he did find us. And he did spank us. Adam and Eve hide from God, but of course that didn't do any good because God knew exactly where they were. The only solution, the only fix was for their sin to be exposed and for them to seek forgiveness. Listen to me this morning. The only cure for the fear of exposure, is to just go ahead and expose yourself. And again, not physically, folks, okay? This is, this, is a family, this is a family establishment. The only cure for the fear of exposure is just to expose yourself. Hey, guys, guess what? I'm a sinner. I messed up. I've made mistakes. I'm going to make some more mistakes. I don't mind telling you, because when I tell you, there is no fear of being found out, because you already know. And I can seek forgiveness there is sin in your life, the fear of exposure will ruin your relationship. Listen, it will ruin your relationship with God and it will ruin your relationship with other people. Sin hurts our relationship with God because God cannot bless us when we're living in sin. When we're actively living in sin, God is not going to bless our life. God is not going to be able to live in a right relationship with us. Sin is going to ruin our relationships with each other because we've got to keep people at a distance. We've got to be secretive. We've got to hide who we really are. And when I'm hiding who I really am, you can't get to know me. Sin always hurts our relationship. The only way to get rid of the fear of exposure is to repent of our sin, is to ask for forgiveness of our sin. And listen to me this morning because this is scary stuff. We try so hard to hide our sin. But listen to me this morning, it will be exposed. Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. Luke chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. Jesus says, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light 
and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetop. I'm sure everyone's heard the old saying, your sins will find you out. This isn't just an old saying. It isn't just a catchy phrase. It's a promise from the Lord. The Lord says, your sins will find you out. Your sins are going to be exposed. And here's the thing, I know that scares us to death, but that's the only way to be free from the fear that we live in when we are so afraid of being exposed. If there is sin in your life, you don't have to live in fear. All you have to do is confess that sin and repent of that sin. And listen to me this morning. Jesus Christ tells us if you confess your sins, He will forgive you of your sins. And there is no burden. There is no fear. There is no worry any longer. And here's the thing. Well, what if people don't like me? Guess what, guys? It's okay if you don't like me because Jesus loves me. I don't have to live in fear that you may not like me. I don't care. My Savior Jesus Christ loves me. And He is willing to accept me with all my faults and all my failures. And He's willing to forgive me. And if Jesus Christ loves me, I'm okay if you don't like me. But here's the truth. The truth is, as we'd be open with each other, what we'd find is we're a lot alike. We've all made mistakes. We've all sinned. And the best way to overcome that fear, really the only way to overcome that fear, is to confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. Again, this is something the church, we've got to do a much better job at in the church. We have conditioned ourselves to come to church to look good and to leave. That doesn't help anybody. Because we're all lying to each other if we're trying to pretend like we're okay. We come to church to be healed, not to be okay. Let's continue reading this morning in Genesis chapter 3. We'll find another fear that can ruin our relationships, which is closely connected to the fear of exposure. Genesis chapter 3, let's pick up in verse 11. Scripture said, he said, this is God speaking, He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. You see, what we're looking at here is something we play at my house a lot, and that's called the blame game. If you have children, I'm sure y'all play the blame game a lot. Who made this mess? Not me. You know, Lydia, did you make that mess? I didn't make that mess. Ford made that mess. Ford, did you make that mess? I didn't make that mess. The dog made that mess. Wow. Hannah walks in, Amy, did you make that mess? I didn't make that mess. Kids made that mess. Right? We blame everybody at our house. God confronts Adam with his sin. God says, Adam. How do you know you were naked? Did you do what I told you not to do? Did you disobey me? And the correct answer would have been, Yes, sir, please forgive me. Yes, sir, I did. Please forgive me. However, that's not what Adam does. You see, Adam does not want to be accountable for his own actions. Adam does not want to be accountable for his own actions. And so listen carefully to his response. Look at verse 12 again, because I want you to notice something really, really important here. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Now keep looking at this, because Adam does something really interesting here. Adam not only blames Eve, Adam blames God. Adam says, yeah, I did it, but, but, first of all, that woman gave it to me, and oh, by the way, who made that woman? You did. Adam simultaneously blames Eve and God for his sin. Yes, he finally does at the end of verse 12 said, I ate it. But he only says that after he says, it's not my fault that I ate it. It's Eve's fault and God, it's your fault. Not to be outdone, Eve quickly passes the blame on to the serpent. You keep reading, you get to verse 13. And God says, Eve, is this true? She's like, whoa, 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 it's not my fault. The serpent deceived me. Not only does the fear of exposure ruin relationships, but listen to me this morning. The fear of accountability will ruin our relationships. The fear of accountability will ruin our relationships. When we are afraid to take responsibility for our own actions, we play the blame game. And when we blame other people and when we blame our circumstances and we blame bad luck and we can even blame God, our relational health suffers. The blame game is never good 
for your relational health. It's hard to be friends. It's hard to form a strong relationship with someone who does not take responsibility for their actions. I don't know about you, but if I had a friend who wanted to blame me and blame everybody else and everything else every time something went wrong, that's not somebody I want to hang around with a lot, is it? We agree with that? So here's the thing. If we don't want to hang out with somebody like that, other people don't want to hang out with us when we're like that. When I refuse to take accountability for my actions, when I, when I blame everything and everyone for what's going on in my life, it's hard to be friends with someone like that. If we want to be relationally healthy, we need to be accountable. We need to take responsibility for our actions. If we've got good friends, we need to ask those friends, hey, hold me accountable. Hold my feet to the fire. I am giving you permission to call me when I'm out of line. I'm giving you permission to say, hey, you need to do better because I want to be held accountable. Not many people are willing to do that, folks, because not many people are willing to hear when they're out of line. But if we want strong relationships, if we want to be relationally healthy, then we have to take responsibility for our actions. And here, I know it's scary. Again, that's the only reason we're talking about fears. I know it's scary to be accountable for your actions, but listen to me this morning. There's a reason the gospel literally means good news. Okay? There's a reason the gospel literally means good news. The good news is that even though I'm not perfect, Jesus Christ loves me. And even though I'm not perfect, when I'm accountable for my actions, when I say, yes, I did it, I can also say, yes, Lord, please forgive me. You see, I can't say, Lord, forgive me, if I meanwhile say it's not my fault. I've got to be accountable for my actions. I've got to say, yes, I did it. Now please forgive me. And here's what the Scripture says, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen to me, folks. This is why the good news is the good news. Because Scripture tells me if I confess my sins, He is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins. So I don't have to fear being accountable because I know forgiveness is available. And so any time that I've messed up or I've made a mistake, and mistake is really a bad word for sin because sin isn't a mistake. Sin's on purpose. Any time I sin, I seem to own up to my sins. Because I know if I confess to the Lord, He'll forgive me. It is truly amazing how freeing that can be. And listen to me, not only should we confess our sins to God, but we're talking about relational health this morning. Not only should I confess my sins to God, but I should confess my sins to those I've wronged. If I've wronged somebody, if I've hurt somebody, I should confess to them. James chapter 5, verse 16 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Confess your sins to one another. It is truly amazing how a damaged relationship can be healed when we take responsibility for our sins, when we take responsibility for our actions, when we sincerely confess and ask someone to forgive us. It's amazing how a broken relationship can be restored. On the other hand, if someone has wronged me and they come to me and apologize, but they spend more time telling me why it's not their fault, it's hard to forgive them, isn't it? Now, of course we're going to forgive them because Jesus tells us to. But it's a lot harder to salvage that relationship when someone keeps telling me all the reasons why it's not their fault. And it's the same for us. When I go to apologize to someone, I don't start by saying, now let me tell you why this isn't my fault. No, I say, you know what, I was wrong. For whatever reason, I was wrong. And I want you to forgive me. As we continue reading Genesis 3, we come to the punishment that God handed down to Adam and Eve. Let's look at this. Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 16. I'm going to skip just a little bit down and look at the punishment to the woman and the man, to Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, 16. Scripture says uh, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. 
And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. A big part of this punishment that God hands down to Adam and Eve is a loss of control. Think about this with me this morning. Adam and Eve were created. They were placed in the Garden of Eden. And what did God tell them? God said, you're in charge. God said, you have dominion over the earth. You see, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were in control. They had control over creation. They had control over the plants. They had control over the animals. They were in charge of all creation. God was still God, but they were in charge of everything that God made. Everything that we see, everything we can touch, everything we feel on this earth, we were supposed to be in charge of that. We were supposed to be in control. We were supposed to exercise dominion. That is until sin entered the picture. And when sin enters the picture, they lose all of that control. Adam is told, yeah, you know what, you're going to eat, but in the Garden of Eden, fruit just grew on trees. You didn't plant those trees. You didn't tend to those trees. You didn't do anything to those trees. It's not going to be the way it is anymore. Now you're going to work, and it's going to be difficult. He tells Eve in uh, verse 16, he says, Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. What we see is a loss of control. A third fear that can ruin our relationships if we let it is the fear of losing control. The fear of losing control. Think about it this moment, this morning. Many of our personal disputes, many of our arguments, many of our fights, many of our disagreements with each other come because we're trying to control one another. We're trying to control one another. How many of you have ever thought to yourself, you know what, everything would be a lot easier if people would just do what I want them to do? You ever thought that? I think it daily. I, every day, I'm like, you know what? If everybody would do exactly what I want everybody to do, I would have no problems. Why? Because I want to control other people. We want to control others. And when we try to control others, we become demanding. And our relational health suffers. We try to control other people. We become demanding and our relationships suffer. We see a perfect example of this in the New Testament with the Pharisees. The Pharisees made a life out of trying to control other people and control other people's actions. Why do you think they hated Jesus so much? Because Jesus shows up on the scene and says, what you're telling these people is wrong. Jesus threatened their control. And they killed him for it. We want to be in control. We want people to do what we want them to do. And when we fear that we are losing control, we become demanding. Just this past week, uh, Lydia received her little progress report from school. Now, she's just in K-4, so she doesn't get a report card yet. It's kind of a progress report. and uh, She did pretty good on most of her things. Uh, there's a conduct issue. She talks a lot. I don't know where she gets that from. Uh, she refuses to be still. I don't know where that's about. Um, but there's one thing in, uh, in particular that stood out to me. It asked, how, how well do they play with others? And they can get one of three marks. How well do you play with others? It can be satisfactory or no, excellent satisfactory or unsatisfactory. So good, eh, okay, and not good. Those are the only three options. Lydia got an asterisk. Like, that's not even one of the child. I don't know what else to read that. What does that mean? Well, it meant there's a note in the bottom of the page. It's on the bottom of the page the teacher wrote, Lydia likes to tell people what to play and how to play. <laughs> to which I said, and? <laughs> that's called leadership. Okay? I can't help it that my daughter's a leader. It's not my fault them kids don't play right. If those kids would play right, my daughter wouldn't have to tell them how to play. She likes to tell people what to play and how to play. And I thought about that as I was preparing my sermon because that's exactly what we like to do. We like to tell people how to play and what to play. And when people don't do what we want them to do, we have problems in our relationships. 
The fact of the matter is we can't control everyone. And the more we try to control other people, the more our relationships suffer. The more our relational health suffer. I mean, let's be honest, folks. We can barely control ourselves. I can barely control me. I definitely don't need to be controlling anybody else. So if we've seen this morning through Genesis chapter 3, if we've seen that fear is a major factor in our relational health, that harms our relational health, what do we do about it? What is the cure? What is the cure for fear? What is the remedy for fear? How do I overcome these fears so that I can improve my emotional health? The cure for fear is love. The cure for fear is love. The cure for fear is to obey the great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, when I fully love God, I don't have to worry about exposing my sins because God already knows my sins. Listen to me, folks. God knows every sin I have committed, every sin I will commit, and He still loves me. So I don't have to fear exposing my sins because God loves me and I love Him. I don't have to fear accountability because, again, God already knows what I've done and He's going to forgive me if I ask Him to forgive me. I don't have to fear losing control because if I'm loving my neighbor as myself, then I'm not trying to control my neighbor. I'm just trying to love them. So I don't have to fear losing control. When we live in God's love, when we abide in God's love, there is no fear. Listen to me this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. John says this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. See, the Scripture tells me there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, there is no punishment coming. There is no eternal punishment. That God is not going to punish you for your sins because you've been forgiven of your sins. And if I've been forgiven of my sins, there is no fear. So I don't have to fear exposure. I don't have to fear accountability. I don't have to fear trying to control you. Because I'm living in the love of God. I'm loving God and I'm loving my neighbor. And perfect love casts out fear. If we want to improve our relational health, if we want to improve our relationships, I guarantee you every one of us have at least one relationship we'd like to see improved. The answer is love. Start by loving God. You know what you'll find? The more you love God, the more you love people. Because we're created in the image of God. And the more I love God, and the more I live in God's love, the more I'm going to love others. And the more I love others, I'm not going to be worried about controlling them. I'm not going to be worried about accountability or, 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 or exposing my sins because I know Lord Jesus Christ loves me. If you want to improve your relational health today, if you want to improve your relationships today, the answer is love. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. There's no reason to live in fear because the Scripture says perfect love casts out fear. If you would stand this morning. Let's enter into a time of prayer. As Miss Deborah comes, I want to open these altars. Maybe you today are living in fear. Maybe there's sin in your life and you're scared to death somebody's going to find it out. How do I get rid of that fear? Well, it's quite easy. You don't have to worry about them finding out what you willingly tell everybody and what you tell the Lord. So repent of that sin. Not only confess it, it's one thing to say, yes, I did it, but we also must repent of it. We must leave that sin. So if there's sin in your life, confess that sin to the Lord and turn around and leave that sin. Repent of that sin. Yes, it is absolutely scary because the devil is telling you all the bad things that are going to happen. But God says, I've got you. And I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to love you if you repent of those sins. Maybe you're living with the fear of accountability. You're scared to death to take responsibility for your actions and you want to blame everybody else and you want to blame your circumstances and you want to blame bad luck and you want to blame God. You know, once we just say, yeah, I did it, it's amazing the burden that is lifted. Yes, I did it. It's my fault. Lord, forgive me. 
if you're living with a fear of control or losing control. You can't control people. It's not your job to control people. It's your job to love people. So let go of those fears today. If you want to come this morning to the altars as we open up the altars, come to the altar and pray. Ask the Lord to take those fears away from you. Begin to live in His love and let that love cast out all fear. As Miss Deborah sings, these altars are open.